So, welcome everybody. Uh, before we start, please, it's a serious note. Please be careful of the cable that's coming across the floor. Um, we don't want any injuries. It's a little bit of a contingency for a problem that we didn't expect. Um, so, welcome, welcome to City Sport, welcome to London. Um, I'm happy to be partners with the MBA in conjunction with the second MBA clinic. Uh, I'd like to welcome Monty and Mark, Gael and Morgan. Uh, for this, more than for the second time. Uh, Monty, Monty McCutcheon is the uh, Vice President of uh, and Referee Development and Training for the NBA Referees. <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, he's involved in the on-court performance and the development and training for the NBA League Referees, also the WNBA and the G League. Uh, and then Associate President, um, Mark Wunderlich. Yeah, local guy. <laughs> also, a member of the officiating uh, development group, so uh, I'd like to welcome these guys. It's a great opportunity for us. Um, basketball's one game, but we know that the NBA and the, the sport in the USA is, uh, has its variances, but it's, it's great to compare and contrast the different philosophies and the concept. So, please put your hands together. <laughs> Good to be here for Mark and I and Guy L. Morgan. Um, one of the things that I have found true um, since David Turner and Mark Wunderlich and I refereed a game in 1989 in Royal Marymount is referees are referees worldwide. And that's a good thing because it draws a certain type of person to come to do the good work that refereeing stands for. And what is refereeing? You know, and for me, I, I have taken a much more we all have, um, you know, Richard has a mechanic system in the Euro League, and, and, you know, FIBA has theirs, and the NBA has theirs, and all of that's well and good. But the core principles of what a referee is have to reflect then back on what sport it is, for me at least. And come on in, don't be. There's no, well, we've been 15 minutes late anyway trying to get this all squared away. Um, <laughs> One of the things that, that I think it's important that we have to answer about if we're going to understand what refereeing is, is what is sport. And at least for me and how I've grown up to think about sport, and as, a, as an adult, spent a lot of time thinking about what sport it is, is that I've come to believe that sport is the way we test ourselves up against otherness, up against something other than myself. And so my daughter's a rock climber. That sport means that she's got to test herself up against the rock. You know, and Rock don't give it about whether she gets up it or not. But in team sport, we're usually testing ourselves up against other people. And if we're going to know that that test is real and authentic, I won the championship and therefore it has validity, then we have to know it's fair. Mm -hmm. Or if I lost the championship in the, in the conference finals, then I have to know it's fair so that I know what I have to then go and work on. And then I can then try to overcome that next or hurdle. That's the reason you hear why it's such a big deal for the Sacramento Kings in this growth pattern to maybe make the playoffs, is to get that taste of it, to know that the hard work that this new coach, Dave Yeager, and their new draft picks, um, Marvin Bagley III, and Deanna Fox from last year, or Paul Stein from a year, few years ago, that they're building something. And so they have to know that it's real, that the, that the rig isn't up, you know, that the, the plan isn't already in in place. And so officials the world over have to deal with that. We have to deal with it at a high scrutiny level that, you know, we favor superstars or we want big market teams to be into the finals. And those are the things that we're constantly battling against. It's not where we stand. It's not, did I get the right angle? People want to know if the people in this room are fundamentally fair so that they can know that all their work that they're doing has meaning. Because that's what we're doing as people, trying to figure out meaning. And so from that standpoint, if we ask that and then say, what is refereeing? For me, it's something that's very sacred. Something that's not, hey, let's go do this on the weekend. Although many of us do do it on the weekend. Please, come on in. It's not that kind of an event. We're here to enjoy each other. So we don't even think it's like a problem. See, we have to then come to that conclusion that we're involved in something really important. The character, 
integrity, fairness, are all part of our core. Then we'll learn from all the people in this room, or we'll learn from Mark and I, where it stands, what to look for, when to look for it. All of those kinds of things are equally important. But we have to understand that it matters. And for me, then we have to then think more step about what refereeing means, and that is we serve. What referees do is they serve. They serve the game, and when we're crew chiefs and we're doing it right, we serve the crew before ourselves. And But we've all worked with people who don't, right? Crew chief thinks that means now you have to go get the car, or you're the one that has to go talk to the ball boy to get the towels, any of the various things. It's now they want other people to serve them. They've got it backwards. And one of the things Mark and Dial and Morgan and I are trying to do is not only teach our brain, but build a culture of people who serve as their core value. So we're going to start with a 10 minute video. All right, it's 10 minutes. That's all right, it's 10 minutes. We got three hours tonight. Uh, Mark and Dial and Morgan and I, I don't have anything else to do but be with y'all. So we believe and be here as long as y'all want to participate. At least 10 minutes of it is going to be this. All right, run this. Enjoy, relax. <coughs> We have volume two? Yeah. This has a lot of value. There's not a lot of talking in it anyway. So if we end up not getting volume, it just it won't be less than. Coincidental that I showed a blind man to a bunch of referees. <laughs> there it is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. when short shorts were still very popular. <laughs> and some of us in this room remember that. One thing that the volume doesn't give that, that I can show you is how much they're talking. Step, 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 step. On your left, on your left. A lot of that's going on between the two people. This is considered the hardest race in America.
The man on the left there who is Senator Beard has run that Dipsy race for 47 straight years. He the last couple of years is the first year he didn't run it and ever since the beginning of this. And Harry Cordellis. Um, for me and the culture that Mark and I and Morgan and Gael are all part of the teamwork that we're trying to establish since I've come off the floor and, and tried to to get back to the game in a different way. Everything I think about refereeing is in that 10 minutes. It's teamwork, it's grit, it's commitment, it's communication, it's the love and passion you have for something to be, you know, to experience some pain. And there's not a single person in this room that hasn't either been Harry or his partner at various stages. We've all walked into something feeling blind and, and naked and not a, not a, able to feel like we're comfortable and what am I going to do about this and am I going to fit in am I going to be able to learn it fast enough and then all of us have had the opportunity to turn around and remember that feeling and for me refereeing is that 10 minutes and we're going to talk a lot about mechanics tonight Mark's going to run us through mechanics we're going to talk a lot about what how I view officiating and what what it imparts to the game and how we give back to the game in the best way. But it all comes back to these principles. Can I help other people along the way? Can I be a good partner regardless of what assignment I have? The NBA has crew chiefs, referees, and umpires in varying degrees of both talent and experience. Most often that means our umpire is the least experienced, but not always. We have some fourth year referees, over 12 year umpires. So talent plays a role in it as well. But anywhere along that scale, whether you're a crew chief, a referee, or an umpire, or heaven forbid, they bring you off the floor and you start to impart different knowledge in different ways, we can say that being a good partner means that regardless of which position we're in, we're willing to communicate. Regardless of which position we're in, we're willing to help someone else along the way. I mean, if you worked with someone when you had a fight in a game, I was stacked, is the first words out of their mouth. Yeah, I want to work with you again. You know, get your story straight and then way through the third quarter on when we all played a role and let this game get a little loose. So for me, what we're going to talk about tonight, everything reflects back to this. Can I serve the game and serve my partner either from the lowest position or the highest position? Because if you can't, at the NBA level, we just hired six people, Brandon Adir, Natalie Sago, Ashley moyer Bleach, uh, Musa Dogger, um, which is great, came to the States when he was 15 with his family, and to see that path come through is amazing, Matt Myers, and Finnison Ransom. And each one of those six people are really good at that film we just watched. 
that regardless of whether we put them in as crew chiefs in the G League or we bring them in to work 50 games or Matt Myers is a perfect example. Matt Myers through various positions of people who held my position that I hold now. I make no mistake about it. Richard's holding the place. I'm holding the place. Mark's holding the place for the people to come along behind us and we'll have these positions. Okay? There is no kingdom, there is no, it's just getting back to the game. Okay? And we had six people, Matt Myers being one of them, that through various bosses didn't believe Matt was capable of being an NBA referee. So he was in his 11th year mm -hmm. in the G League. There wasn't a single G League referee that you could find over those, the last seven or eight, he came to camp in his fourth year, which means he got preseason NBA games. So between his fourth year and his 11th year, things didn't look good for Matt. And yet you can't find a G League referee in that, so those seven years, that he didn't, that won't tell you he wasn't bitter, he always helped, he always told the mistakes he made that he thought kept him from rising up to the level so that they would make the same mistakes. Not only do we need people who can get plays right, but I need people like Matt Myers on our staff. And I need people like Matt Myers who are willing to serve the game even as people start to leapfrog over. And I think that I can't emphasize enough that good refereeing is about teamwork, and it's about being connected to two other people, and that we work a system, that Richard or Simon or myself or anyone believe in enough to share that that's our system that we work in. And you can't be an excellent referee if you think you're the Lone Ranger, or if you think you're the one whose judgment is going to save the day. Without Gael in the office, I can't function on a daily basis. I just can't. She runs so many things that allow me to do my work. And all of those layers of connectedness, of teamwork, mean that all of you then get to go out, and if you're willing to connect in those ways, then we can then say it's a well-officiated game. Daryl Garrison, we were talking about this the other day, Daryl Garrison um, was the boss when David and, and Mark and I worked our game at Lower Marymount in the Summer League. And he used to say he loved no-name crews that would go out and work a good system, work for one another to serve the game, and have it go off just like that. Now, sometimes the coaches, we made John go a little full-time crew chief two years ago, and prior to meeting in the boss, he was made a full-time crew chief, and he's working with Kane Fitzgerald and Tyler Ford, I think, the game. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure not um, but they had six technical fouls. I'm not kidding. That doesn't, that's not reflective of the work they did. Okay, the league wasn't quite ready for that youth. That's all right. If I'm going to ask referees to be courageous, if I'm going to ask referees to have uh, a moral compass and stand strong under duress, then most certainly Mark and I, as people who assign games, have to have the same courage to know who's doing the work, to know who is a good teammate, to know who is a good partner, to know who is going to be honest in their game reports. And if the league's a couple of years behind me, behind finding out who can really referee, then it's my job to withstand that weathering storm or weather that storm over those two years. And I think that when we all put it together in our various responsibilities, we have the opportunity to serve the game at its highest levels. And that's what we're all striving for, isn't it? And I, I, when I was in the, just getting started, I wanted to work some varsity games. You know, when I, I did work for varsity game, but that's a separate story. Uh, when, when you see above you, you want to work college, university, you want to work the, the minor leagues of the NBA, you want to work in the WNBA, and then you want to work in the NBA. And when you get in the NBA, you don't want to be an umpire. And you're always looking up. We used to say that if there was, there was one happy guy a year, that's the Game 7 crew chief, because the other two guys on Game 7, the ultimate assignment, were still grumbling that they weren't a crew chief, right? And we can't let ourselves get bogged down in those kinds of thoughts, even though they're human nature, we have to say, no, if I got three no-name people and I get to be one of the no-name people, man, nothing's better than going out and surprising 
our bosses that we did a nice job tonight through this sense that we saw in the race. Teamwork, grit, character, and trusting one another. Before we get into the mechanics, know this. The NBA mechanical system is based on two fundamental principles that are non-negotiable. Now, it doesn't mean we do them every night. It just means that we have to hold them accountable to the people not doing it every night. And it's not something I will ever negotiate up against. And that is that discipline and trust are indelibly linked. You may not have one without the other. I can't trust you if I'm not well disciplined. And if I have no discipline, I ain't trusting you. Ever worked with someone when you tell them you're in the penalty? They bring the penalty. And the first thing they do is look up at the score of the court. You don't need trust in you. You haven't earned their trust yet. And that's what we're working towards is a discipline through our mechanic system that I know I'm supposed to be looking here right now and that I trust Sarah's going to look over here. And if I have that trust, then there'll be per certain parts of the game that I don't know what happened. We've worked some historically important games, Mark and I have. And they're worth a 55-point Michael Jordan game. I know he had a pretty good game. I'm still a shock to see the, the stat sheet after the game. Because there were parts of that game I locked in. So before we get to the plays, the last thing I'll say is this. You know, over three hours, you're going to get tired of my metaphors. It only took our staff about 10 minutes. Right? But do our senses let things in, or do they keep things out? We're taught to think that our senses let things in. You know, my eyes let in something I can see, but they don't. Our senses really keep things out to bring clarity. All right? So right now the fan and that's going off. There's some other noises in here as we wrestle around and do all this that we factor out. My eyes can't see x-ray vision. They can't see all the dust particles when the sun comes in. I can't feel everything that, that touches my skin, flies and whatnot. All of that is so that our body has a chance to make clarity on what it does see. Or that we can make sense of the, the person we're trying to listen to at the airport while all the other stuff is going on that is in the background noise. Refereeing is very similar. If I don't trust that someone else has that area covered and I try to see everything, I end up seeing next to nothing, the ends of things, two tenths of a play. Whereas if I'm on a play because I trust Mark has that and Gael has this, and now I can watch this, these two people, my responsibility, for a very long time. Well, that goaltending is easy to see when it gets knocked off the glass. And that foul is easy to see when I watch them over four steps. But when my head is on a swivel, because I want to make sure Mark's area is getting covered over there, and now something happens over here that i got to turn on and I get very little time to see it, I end up seeing nothing. And that's one of the great paradoxes of refereeing is that if I'm willing to see more of less and three people trust the mechanical system, that is the agreed upon mechanical system of whatever it is you're working for, you know, if you jump from supervisor to supervisor, then you got to know what it is, that the different leagues that you work in, what's required. But if I trust that mechanical system and I can watch more of less and all three of us carry our water and carry our weight, then we're going to be a no-name crew that works a really good game that night. If you've got someone who wants to ride in on a white horse all the time and make sure that they let you know that their judgment is better than yours on this, was it a foul, was it not a foul, then we have what? If you're the most experienced official, and from us at the 12-minute quarter, and at 11, 15 of the first quarter, someone passes on a hook. It could be a block shot, and it could be here. And I'm the most experienced person, and I come in from 40 feet and get that because I'm really good. <laughs> I'm really good. Right. What does it do to that young person? If I'm working with Natalie Sago, what does it do to Natalie Sago? That's her credibility goes down. She's now got to deal with coaches. Her confidence goes down. And she doesn't want it to happen again, does it? You ain't blowing in front of me. So now I speed my whistle up. Now I'm not processing plays anymore because I don't want my 40, my 25-year vet blowing in front of me because now i got to take this crap from this coach over here. 
So your 100% night, because I'm really good, right? The coach is not on me. I've been in the league a long time. Boy, I got that player. I see he touched him right there. Your 100% night drove the crew's percentage from 91% down to 74% because you sped everyone's whistle up, you made them nervous, you lost some confidence, they had to give a technical foul and throw out a coach, all of which which impacted their future decisions because now they're not thinking in the present moment. <laughs> I threw that coach out, oh, he's going to be mad. Now they're thinking about the future and the past at the same time instead of the present, all because of no discipline, no trust. As a more experienced person, you do have to every now and then go in to help someone, right? Mark has the best phrase for that. I'm going to steal it, but I'll give him credit. The best phrase for that is, if something illegal happens that, you, that serves the game, and you have more experience, someone gets clocked in the head hard, then you have to help, right? And then educate them. But if it's my judgment's better than your judgment kind of play, on these 50-50 kinds of plays, and trust and discipline is what gets us to the no-name crew doing an excellent job. Mark will go over the mechanics tape first. Remember, these are NBA mechanics. We believe in them. We believe in them wholeheartedly because we watch a lot of tape. That is not to say that there isn't another mechanic system that doesn't have value. All right? We're not trying to sell anything here. But this is what we know. <laughs> and this is what we're going to share. And then you got to filter through Richard and everyone else. You know, whether it has validity for all the leads that you're with. Mark, you want to take us through it? Sure. We're having a little issue with the. Uh, the yeah, sorry about it. This is not our system. Unfortunately, we're having issues displaying the videos. Oh, so I'll, I'll just start. Maybe I can, if we get it going, maybe I can okay. show you. There's, I guess the best three ways to learn is what? Hear, see, do, right? You hear it, you see it and you go do it, right? Best way to learn, right? So basically the system, Richard systems, our system starts with, you have to start at the pedal of the spot. So if I'm a trail, I have to know where the slot is. I have to know where the lead is. So we all have to start in a dependable position, right? Because if we have a trail, and then this slot starts high, and the lead is wide, right? I, so we start in a dependable spot collectively every time we have and we position adjust based on players. Players walk in front of us, we adjust, right? So we work off the players. So that's the first thing, we gotta to get to a dependable spot, right? The second thing is, and important is, when we're in that spot, we have to look where we should be looking, right? So there's, there's gonna be an on ball, there's gonna be two secondary coverages, right? And we work off each other's eyes. So the on ball official, right? He's on ball, we have the two other officials off ball. Okay, work it off. And then when you're off ball, you have certain keys like players in motion versus stationary. Who's more dangerous? Right? The players in motion. So when you have decisions with inside your primary off ball, which you have throughout a game, you have decisions with inside your primary. Choices to make inside your primary, who to look at. You would choose the motion player versus the stationary player, right? Right? Because you're out there and you're trying to make decisions with inside your primary. Right, so now you get inside your primary, and the big thing that Monty and I really press is once you're there, is to not only watch the plays, but watch plays in the right order. All right, we got that. Okay, so we'll run this, but we'll run it before I just come up. So basically, what I'm trying to tell you is, you get to your spot, the final spot, you're looking where you should be looking. Now you gotta watch the plays in the right order. Called sequencing. Okay? Because you can watch a play and be in the wrong order. Let me give you an example. Screeners screen for shooters. We all agree on that, right? That's what screeners do. In our league, they sell a lot of hammer screens, a lot of flare screens, right? So we have sequencing. So when you're watching ball ball screening, you have to watch the screen first, the line second, and defender third. Because if you go to the line first, right, and then you go to the screening action, what's already happened? He's already got hit. 
So if you're out of sequence, if you're out of order, when you're watching plays, you will miss plays. It's not where you should be looking, it's the order which you should be looking at. Right? Same with jump shooters, right? Jump shooter goes up, jump shooter comes down, then we get a rebound. One, two, three. You can't go one, two, he lands on a foot, three. Every time. There's a bunch of them. When you get your spot, you have to get into the right order. Right? That's the habit portion of this. So, Monty, the big believer as I am, two things, mechanics and habits. Right? So, mechanics, know where you're standing. You know where you're looking. You know the order you're looking at. And then you have really good habits. Um, me personally, a very average talent referee. And I got a science like game six with money in 2010. 10. Very average guy. Not the most talented guy, not as talented, you know, you will say no, but not as talented as a mind touching or a scuff also. But I rose to game six of the NBA final. Because I believe if I was solid mechanically, I watched plays in the right order. Right? Got to my spots. Had discipline for open looks. Called plays I saw willing to call plays, had great courage that I could withstand the fact that I have as much talent as somebody else. Because I do believe that you're not born with good judgment. It's not an eight. It's a cramp that's worked at. Now, right? Hard work. But you have to do it every time you work. May it be a rec league game, may it be a college game, a university game, pro game, right? It's every night you work. You work the same way because I, the staff laughs, but I believe every quarter, every game, every schedule, you work the same way. The same habits. Find a spot, look in the right area, see that's the place. Discipline, discipline, discipline. We have a saying that what you do in November comes out in June. There are only a few games in June, and every one of them are scrutinized. What you lay down in November with your nightly work when you've got two teams that are struggling to find their way, if you serve that game with the same passion that you serve the NBA Finals, if you do that over a year, 65, 70 nights a year, over year over year, then when you have that play in game six, it doesn't surprise you, you're ready for the moment, when LeBron blocks that ball and it's only two inches off the backboard, you're not afraid that it's two inches. You know it's close, but you know that you put your work in. That's really what he just said is so important. Every quarter, every game, every schedule, and you treat each coach and you treat each team as though they just made the promise. Do that, you're in respect, and you lay down your craft layer after layer. One quick thing. Famous for. Smile, right? That's what we all think. But in the art world, it's famous for the fact that he laid down 200 layers of paint through x rays, they know this. And they laid down layer after layer after layer after layer of thin paint to build up what he wanted to build up in the paint. The paint. He's refereeing. Taking the time to lay down every thin layer and don't skip steps. If you don't skip steps, then five years from now, you're not the same referee. And even though that's a long view, it can be disappointing at the time when other people who are maybe you know, saddling up for the beer with the boss get there a little quicker, they're skipping steps. They may get that first playoff game, and there's going to be something in that game they don't know how to handle. You're going to come in later, you're going to have made it two years later, you're going to be there for 16 straight years. What we're striving for is crap. That's great. And to Monty's point, same thing with the screen line defender I just talked about. You might watch it in that sequence 30 straight times in a game, and there's nothing illegal. But that one time you go out of sequence and something illegal happens because you created bad habits and you didn't stay to your discipline. You 
missed the eleven screen. Right? To Monty's point. It's like we always say, it's like planes take off the land every day. We're just looking for that one that crashes. Right? We want to make sure we're in the right spot when we see it. Right? And that's because you have to discipline every time down the floor. Now we're going to show you some of that taxon. And basically what we're going to say here is to Monty's point, your system is your system. This is our system. But the 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 basics as far as like the handoffs that we'll go over as far as Monty and I working off each other eyes is I give the ball to Monty, I give off the ball. As Monty accepts, I give off. They're called handoffs. All right. We've tried to, because of our freedom movement guidelines this season, we've tried to reduce that width of four eyes on the ball. Alright? So when I hand off the money, we try and reduce that time. Because I, what does that allow me to do? Get off the ball soon, right? Once I trust that money is accepting the ball, I now get off the ball quicker, which is reduces the width, and I see the play earlier. And what happens when you see plays earlier? You see them longer. What happens when you see them longer? They're slower. When you see plays early, you see them longer, and they become slower. When you get to plays late, they surprise you. And then you have a tendency, as Monty talks to the staff a lot about, making early decisions. And I'll let Monty touch on that a little bit as far as... The mistakes we see in our, on our, that come in every night, I'd say 80 to 90% of the mistakes we see are early decisions. And so we have a process of working our mind. So physiologically, not mentally, not a metaphor, we want the air in our belly. All right? So that, what's the worst signal you can give as a referee? I call Gael, and I blow my whistle. Player bumps Gael and blows the whistle, and then that same player comes up and just has this most beautiful block you've ever seen in your life. You've got to be the walk of shame, right? <laughs> and push to me, push to me. And all anyone in the building sees is this great block shot, right? We've all done it. And there are no people who haven't done every mistake that gets made worldwide. We all go through the process. And we continue to do it. The difference is, the people who do the sequencing and put the work in, they do it two times a month. Someone who's undisciplined does it 14 times a month. Now, over a course of a season, those percentages build up. But there's no perfection in any referee. The, anyone telling you different is they're full of self-love. Uh, you know, they can't quite get over themselves. But when you say, okay, I'm going to put the air in my belly, and I think that bumps a foul, and it starts to rise up, and I'm going to make that decision, and then I see that great block, what do you get to do? Shove it right back down. So physiologically, if you want to know where you're at mentally, check where you are at physically. So if I've got that whistle, that, that tongue in the middle of my whistle, and I'm really ready because it's a tie game and there's two minutes, I'm not in a good place mentally or physiologically. So in some of the better games, in one of the game sevens I was fortunate enough to work, I told myself that they had five minutes. Cleveland and Golden State had five minutes where they didn't score. And every decision the referee was going to make was going to have more import. It was toward, it was in the fourth quarter, and it was five minutes. And I said, the hell with that in the stomach air stuff. That thing should be under your shoe. You know? <laughs> it's going to have to get through the, the, the rubber of my shoe. It's going to have to come up through my leg. It's going to have to find its way all the way up here. And that allowed me to check where I was physiologically, where my air was, so I could relax. And then I knew I was where I was supposed to be mentally. What's my, what's my sequencing? Where's my primary? Who's going to hurt me? And I follow all the things that Mark talked about. And that way, I become a late decision maker. Now, early and late is still a real short window. Early, I mean, we're talking nanoseconds here between early and late. You can't be having people run down to the other end of the floor. We all, yeah, that was a crap. <laughs> <laughs> they all come back. Right? It doesn't work that way. Right? But there is a difference as we grow in understanding that a lot of our mistakes come from that desire to pounce. So check yourself. You know, on video, see when your right hand, which is your calling hand, see when it's ready to go. You can see it. How many of you have seen yourself on tape do this? 
you had a trail, you're on the ball, you're on ball, and then you're on ball a little too long, but you don't know it yet. But on tape, this is what you see. Shit. <laughs> over here, right? That's your mind. Your body is always going to give your mind away. If you're watching tape, physiologically, your body will give your mind away. And if you're walking into your rotations, your head is turning, we see all this in the positions that we are watching tape over and over and over. But what we also see is that a lot of misses come from staying on ball too long, having a wide width of our handoff between Mark and I, and I'm on it too long because I don't quite trust him to handle the two best players with four fouls, and I'm going to watch this, and then my head is on that swivel, and I can see physiologically and physically where the referees have made their mistakes. Or they take the home run trot and trail the lead. I might go and get settled in here in the lead and finally turn around now there's a block charge on top of it. And we'll get to the force of the play, up against the legality of the play, and ugly but legal when we get into some tape. Let's watch this real quick. So basically what I'm saying is we make early decisions live. Because we, play, we don't see the play longer, which makes it slower. Right? That forces the air out. That makes us react quicker, right? So the two times you make a mistake with whistles are early decisions and when you call plays at close lungs. You, you see, in our system, we really believe what's closed to me is going to be open to Morgan and mine. What is it? Trust the discipline, right? Right. And do I have that fresh, threshold of pain? Right? Do I have that threshold of pain to say, even though I'm next to this, I'm closed, I can't see this. And that's where proximity and primary really don't match up. It may be open to the trail. Right? But that's where we have to trust each other. And they'll come and get that part, right? So it's early decisions, open looks. If, 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 you, if you trust, if you, if you call plays with open looks, and you discern, you slow yourself down, you get the people early, you slow the play down, you'll be a better, much better decision maker tomorrow than you are tonight. All right, so let's talk about what Mark said there, because it's really important, and it's at, at one of the sort of foundational pieces. The best referees are discerners. They're not reactors. The best referees make their decisions on the back end of it, not the front end. Because on the front end, what do I do? Well, that looks ugly. Like I got a foul. All right? But if I'm at the back end of it, and I've processed the play because I've been on it a long time, then there's black and white, right? We all know that someone gets clocked in the head. That's a foul. I don't care worldwide, that's a foul. But within a game, we also know there's a lot of gray, right? And if I slow the play down, and I know that my partner just passed on a maybe vertical, maybe not, not black and white, gray. Maybe he jumped a little A to B. Not definitively A to B. My partner decided that wasn't a foul. And if I'm a discerner, and I've slowed my play down on the very next possession, and it's gray, not black and white, what should I do for game? I should no call it. But if I see it late, because I'm not good on my mechanics or good on my sequencing, then I worry about who? Number one. I worry about me, and then I call the foul, and then I don't understand why I've got to give that coach down there a technical foul. Black and white are standard. I'm going to say this, and we'll see it in tapes, and we'll get to the mechanics. Situational awareness, context, knowing what your partners have called is absolutely necessary to be an elite official. Absolutely. Because it informs you on those tough plays that we all have. My goodness, is that enough? We all feel that. The situational awareness cannot override standards. That a play gets hit, a player gets hit, that's a standard, that's a foul. I can't sit there and say down there, yeah, but my partner passed on a maybe A or B play when this guy got his arm hit. That's a standard. Situational awareness cannot exceed your standards or you have no integrity. You have, and I mean collectively, not you personally. I just mean that, that we don't have integrity if I'm passing on some guy getting clocked up against his head because my partner passed on a, a maybe or maybe not A to B. There, those are two different things. But if I don't slow the place down, 
I have no chance to be a discerner and to be consistent with my partners. None. Right? Let's watch some mechanics video. That's my idea. That was a that was a correct call. <laughs> yeah. uh, just in case anyone was wondering. So that's about rotation, position adjustments. Duke's working the game up in the right hand there. He's working the more. He's working uh, third mm -hmm. yeah. Joey was here last year. Played some of you came back after that. <laughs> <laughs> the pendulum positions would be talked about, right? Starting in a good spot. Transitional coverage, like Bonnie talked about, trail lead, getting to the front of the pack. Big picture view, when you're off ball, right, seeing the main players you can see. Making decisions like that. Teamwork and trust, which is my press the whole night on, right? This is like, okay. So it is, we'll bounce around so we don't stay too long on this, but we'll just, this is our basic setup. We have a trail, pretty afraid So we have our trail, right? We have our lead, which mine in the lead, and we have our slot. Everybody's in the federal spot. He's at free throw line extended. He's on ball. Lead is off ball. Slot is off ball. So we have everybody covered. See? Okay? Right. So, Case is not up here, Jason isn't here, right? We all start in the same spot every time down the floor. Because I have to know where everybody's standing, so I know where everybody's going. So fundamentally, we want our trail to always keep the sideline. We want to be refereeing outside the end as much as possible at every position. And if we get on the floor, if this is my sideline, and I'm refereeing outside to into the game, and I sacrifice that through poor discipline, and I come up here, now I've got a referee, some outside in, but some inside out. Like I gotta turn back this way to get this corner. Now I'm on a swivel, instead of being able to take in the big picture without movement. So we want our trail, except in one specific in instance, we want them to be keeping their sideline as their guide, all right? Especially with our game changing to a lot of volume threes and layups, right? We need whiff on the perimeter because we need to get to, we don't like to be moving on the catch with three point shooters. We like to be stationary in a catch so we can go through our sequence. I'm not sure the last time I seen that we ever dive down to a three point shot. We haven't done it in three years. Three years ago, that's all we did. We would dive down late to a shot, right? Now we're wide, we have width, we are silent, we're silent attached. And Jason, there's space here. If something does happen, he can make a choice in his primary and get a little bigger, right? See more. Make sense? If you have any questions, just stop us. Right, Mike? Yeah, and we need to be aware of a break. After the mechanics tape, we're good. Maybe take it. Where are we at on break? Yeah. Yeah. All right, good deal. Now we started a little late. So this is a rotation. We work off of the lead. The lead starts our rotation. And once the lead starts it, everybody reacts to it, right? So we like to walk in the lead and referee. We like we like to referee through our rotations. We don't walk to the next spot. We don't try and get to the next spot. We referee to the next spot. So when I'm going trail to slot, I continue to continue to referee. When I'm going lead strong side, to, you know, from strong side to weak side, I referee, weak side to strong side, I referee, continue to referee through my rotation. I don't go, I'm going to take this five seconds off get over here. You referee through your rotation. Continuing to concentrate on motion players versus stationary players and going through the order you're sequencing where you should be going. So we're going along a good spot. Every Mark's off ball. Scotty's off ball. Look at Scott's head. He has no pressure here. Look at the trust he has in in, in every look at Mark. Mark is off ball. You'll see it in their heads. 
it's really important today to get off ball because if you can get off ball early, you can you can see the freedom of movement plays sooner. The wraps, the holes, the impedes, right? Versus if you're if you're not off ball, you get to it late. But the big thing being off ball in the lead, when you're off ball, you're on usually secondary defenders, right? What what happens on drives and basket? Who can test plays to the basket? Secondary defenders. Right? Weak side defenders, right? So if you've been all ball on that weak side defender where you should be, and now he drives, how slow is that play for you? What do we do though? What hap what's happened to the NBA game and game I think worldwide because of Steph Curry? It's opened up, right? So you have five wide, there'll be no post play, everything will be open, and then that guy's got the one on one. James Harden's got the one on one at the top of the key, right? And we know he's going to do one of two things, shoot the three and try to get to the rim because our game is layups and free and three-pointers now, all right? So if he comes to the rim, well, I want to get on that early, don't I, in the lead? All the way out there at the top of the key because I know that guy's coming and I'm going to have that play. But i got a trail that's on that defender. My discipline says I need to be on my help defender because he's the one that's coming over from the weak side for a multiple defender play. And if my trail does his job, her job, and takes it all, they take their defender all the way to the hoop, because that player's mine. And I do my job. And I got sign. He's mine. Then we get to play covered as a team. And then when that trail calls that whistle on his or her defender, I don't feel that angst like my man, which is what we all feel. Because we don't referee the ball in the paint, we referee people in the paint. Point, right? And we teach where the help comes from, the help side defender. In our league, the help side defender usually comes from the weak side. Strong side defenders in our league usually stay attached. Like when we drive down on the lane and as a corner shooter, in our league, the defender will usually stay attached. Why? It's real easy to catch and shoot, right? But the help will come from the weak side. So if you're a referee in a lead and you know where the help's coming from, what's that allow you to do? Get to them sooner. There's three ways to protect the rim. You know three ways to protect the rim, right? Take charges, block shots, and make people play through the living contact. We're responsible for all three. We have to discern all three perfectly. Block charge, block shots, play through the living contact. That's our job. They're training every day, teaching that, and we have to reward good defense, right? Can you agree? Good. This is accepting ball on ball, and then we can take a break and we'll do it. Yeah, yeah, let's do. Let's get through the mechanics. All right. So see Mark. Now watch Mark's head. As soon as, as soon as the ball goes down to the post, watch Mark's head in the trail. So we use free throw line extended as our mark. Which is where we have in the early. You guys free throw accept all lead here? Free throw line extended. Yep. So the lead accepts. So Mark will work off of Tommy's eyes. Once Tommy accepts, Mark gets off. Okay? How many of y'all seen the Adams family? Gomez? <laughs> yeah? What is Gomez famous for? Never moves his head, but his eyes are back and forth. <laughs> Don't be a Gomez. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you are actually a Gomez. We actually have one. Yeah, well, yeah Ronnie we and I, Ronnie 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 actually, we were actually working with one in the CBA. We used to call him Gomez. Mm -hmm. but we go, I go like this. All right, because what's the issue? <laughs> I'm working crazy. off your eyes, and you're supposed to be on the ball, but we also have post here that you're worried about. And you're going from the ball to the post, and you're going back and forth. The trail tries to play off your eyes. And that's no trust, and that's no discipline. I got ball, I know the trail's going to come down and get this post because that's his or her responsibility. That's really important that we trust those little insecure moments. Because man, it really feels like Carl Malone and Buck Williams are beating the hell out of each other over here. I have to trust somebody has that. that. Okay. So, so you watch Danny, Danny goes to the point of contact, right? We try the point of contact is the contact that occurs, so we aim small and small. Right? We get to the point of contact, we try and zero in. He'll watch him go up, he'll watch him go down, and then he'll go to rebound. In the meantime, these two officials will cover the rebounding coverage. 
until the supplier returns it. So then we have 94 by 50 copies. Okay? Sure. Question? Is it supposed to check when the supply stop goes in and someone else wants to contact them? No, he has the supply. He, he takes the supply up, he takes the plate down, then he goes to redo. Here's the problem for us is, is that we we ran into, we were missing the down part. Laying off feet. And so people were closing out and sticking their foot on the landing spot. Kawhi Leonard then turned around and is out for six weeks. And we hadn't been doing our good work that we used to view that as, well, they're just playing the game, that's accidental. And we were finding not so accidental. Let me just leave that foot over here for a little bit. All right. And so we want to make sure if we have two if we have four eyes on that, that yeah, you go up and down. He sees he goes to the port of country, he stays with he stays with the shooter, he doesn't leave the shooter until he comes down. I think the question you're asking though is, we have the belief that we will, if I go up to point of contact and body contact is there, all right, I am going to see egregious body contact through that process. But if body contact is so inconsequential I couldn't see it unless I was, then we, at, our, at the NBA level, that we view that as incidental contact. Whereas if they're going through their space and banging them, I'm going to have the ability to both go to point of contact and then finish that play all the way through. Our, our guideline there, or our, our rule that we use is, they must be able to come back down to a normal playing position. And if we can't, then we want the foul. And if that process is such body contact that we want, our, our, we have found that our guys and, and women will get that part. But this is much more difficult to see. So we put our eyes in the percentage basis where the most trouble will occur, right? And, if, and the play drawing guidelines are, you know, I'm sure Joey went over it last year, right? It's all about players' lift, defenders' lift. So the defender has to have the lift to get above ball, right? So the ball's here. He has lift Let's talk it. about it, because this is great. I'm the shooter, all right? And Mark, back up for me, Mark, right here. Mark's afraid of my speed, so he's got to get <laughs> 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 All right. All right. So he's from here, and I go here. He can't get to the ball from that distance. Where does his arm go? He goes this way, right? So you win this play before it ever happens <clears throat> if you're where you're supposed to be seeing this play a long time. So if I see this play from this distance, and I see a shot going up, I've already won the play because I know on a percentage basis it's very difficult for equal players to get up to here from there. Whereas if I'm here and Mark goes up for the shot, I don't respect his speed. So I'm not on it. Uh, he has no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here. I'm going to go vertical. All right? And I'm more than likely going to be, if we're equal players, that in terms of height and all that, we'll both be up near the ball. All right? You win this play early. Okay, where else do you win this play early? Pump fakes. I pump fake, and Mark jumps towards me. Dead in the water. If I jump into him to ensure that, defensive foul. What is everyone going to say, though? He initiated contact. Yes, I did initiate the contact because you lost the battle when you jumped A to B. Mark, I pump fake. And now I jumped into him when he had that vertical position. Offensive foul. Okay? So you win these plays early through your discipline, not late. Because in both instances, the offensive player will have done what? Jumped into a defender. There's a difference in the legality of both those plays. Right? Based on the legality of the defensive play. To my point, whoever jumps first is what? Let's compromise. Right? <coughs> the defender jumps first, there's no stomach. That's why you hear coaches say, stay down, stay down, stay down, stay down. Right? Everybody get it? So we have, we have that play, and then we'll speed up, we'll speed his run for a little bit, then we'll show the sequencing between Danny and Mark. Yeah, and that's an important And we're going to end it on that. that. Any questions on what? I mean, the mechanic, our, our mechanics are. 
probably the thing that has made us in the last three years <clears throat> more right. disciplined. We yeah. trust each other more often, but yeah. we're holding people accountable who don't do those things. We see Carl work walk referee through his rotation in the league, right? So the, just 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 for uh, clarity, I just a little bit the play that you just shown with the uh, the jump shot there on the outside, the lead coverage in the European game is it, uh, slightly different in that it, it's just a bit shallow from the free throw line. But, but this shot would be covered by the lead official. This one. Yeah, the, the previous shot, the previous, uh, shot. previous play. And, and just to clarify the question, um, I think uh, the lead official's in a great position on the baseline, and it's the same position that we would have in the European game. You've got the distance, but also I think the, the point which you, you did clarify is that the, the referee needs to see the, the story from the beginning of the play That's right to the end. That's right. So, so they, 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 can't, they can't read part of the story, then cut off and expect another referee to take, take out. They need to see the whole picture. So they can digest the play, delay the call, and make, make a really informed decision. What is the offensive player going to do if he knows his defender is up at the ball? Right. He's already in his shooting motion. He's going he's to get wide, isn't he? Flop. He's going to go down. He's going to try to get legs out. He's going to try to get some arms out. My concern is the legality of the defensive player coupled with a high threshold of pain. <laughs> All right, and if you don't have a high threshold of pain, you can't referee James Harden. You can't referee any of our best players. That better never show up on Twitter. <laughs> I don't say that to that. No. Your discipline. All right. All right. But the reality is, it's not just James Harden. At the NBA level, we have tons of people wanting to fool you. And it goes, it goes back to, how many of you know Cal, uh, Calvin Murphy's name? He's a Hall of Famer, five foot seven, uh, played in the 60s and 70s, big time scorer at five foot seven in our league. He used to practice, step forward for me. He used to put one more. He used to practice putting his foot two inches in front of their landing spot while you were dribbling. Practiced it, hour after practice. Just two inches before your landing spot so that that person's toe would stub with his toe. And what did every referee view it as? Incidental contact. Oh, no. Yeah, just, yeah. oh, that's too bad. Should be. Yeah, about 500 points a year he got <laughs> off those layups that went from that. Our pra all of our players practice fooling referees, right? And so if I know the legality of the defensive player and I have a high threshold of pain, then I have the opportunity to get these plays right. But if I see the play late, what happens to my threshold of pain? It plummets. Because now I don't have all the information and my threshold of pain you know, it's 78 degrees outside of Fahrenheit, sorry, I don't know the Celsius. <laughs> 78 degrees out Fahrenheit, and I gotta have four coats on. Because I don't know how cold it is out there, and I give in to the play every time. And it doesn't matter whether you're Joey Crawford or Brandon Adair in his first year. If you have a low threshold of pain because you don't have all the information, then you give in to all the shenanigans. And that makes you a poor decision maker. Last so we're just going to show you how the importance of getting off the ball. And we'll show a little sequence with the eyes. Okay, so Zach's on ball here, right? Great referee, poor discipline here. So if he frees it, Gator Graham. So now where should, who has we, our lead accepts ball. So we talked about handoffs, how quickly we want to reduce the width, right? We want the trail to get off, right? We want it to be like that, right? Why is Zach's head? He, we have four eyes on two players and we have no coverage on this inter interchange and nothing happens really bad on this interchange but it shows the fact that something might happen bad. All right so let's talk about this play though. Jason Terry is 136 years old. <laughs> he's been playing in the league since he was four and he's guarding the MVP. All right. But if we get to that late, like Zach does, he doesn't see it. We don't know whether Steph Curry's locked his arm, because Steph Curry's 90% free throw, and we're in the penalty, and if I can get to the free throw line and snap my head, then I get two points automatically, because I'm 91%. So if I don't know that, then I devalue Jason Terry's work, 
when he may be really grinding out a good defensive possession, or I miss him trying to rough up the MVP, get him off his game, to irritate him. He may have just hit seven threes. Steph Curry just hit seven threes. And in checks Jason Terry. <laughs> Ain't it go off in your head? <laughs> uh, a quick story before we get to this. Western Conference Finals the year before Oklahoma City and San Antonio Spurs. First game of the season, Oklahoma City. They want ratings on opening night. Oklahoma City, San Antonio. Manu Ginobili checks in in the middle of the first quarter. I'm standing right next to Scotty Brooks. And right next to Scotty Brooks, I see Ginobili check in. And without Scotty Brooks even turning in his head, up pops Derek Fisher to check into the game. Now what does that tell me? That was predetermined. When this player checks in, this player checks in. Doesn't mean you find something that's not there. It means something went off that decisions in my primary that Mark Wunderlich talked about a few minutes ago, I now within my primary know what's happening between Derek Fisher and Manu Ginobili. We had three legitimate fouls in nine seconds. And you know what Derek Fisher said? I'm done. <laughs> he wanted it in his Ginobili's head. He came by me and said, I'm done, Monty. Like, I did what I needed to do. That's what I was supposed to do. He just wanted it in Mono's head. You've got to be able to apply lots of information to be an excellent referee. Now, what's the key? You can't call three fouls that aren't there. You have to referee the play and have integrity about the play and understand that your work that your knowledge allows you to be open to what happened, and then you have to be disciplined enough to let it happen. Because you can be wrong. I can fill a book up with my mistakes. The idea, though, is you've got to be aware of it all. But the chance so is Zach, cool. as we talked about earlier, does what? He stays on the ball too long, doesn't accept the handoff, right? So we have four eyes on the ball, we have no time on the four point, right? You know, two. Just try to, that's where his eyes should be. Right? With a quick handle, if we're doing it correctly. Right? Still not on, right? Right. Never went. Now Locked watch, in. Now watch Danny Crawford do this. Although, watch his head. See his head? Where's he at already? Off. Off. He's there early. Three game seven. Danny Crawford was. Danny Crawford is soon. Discipline. As soon as the ball went, I'm sorry, as soon as the ball went to post, Danny did exact opposite of what Zach did. He gets off. He gets off early. Why do we get off early? Because why? And we can see what? Longer. And what's that make it? Slower. Slower. All right, but if there's anyone on the planet that has the right to not be disciplined, it's that man right there. He already worked two game sevens in his career at the point of this game. Man, I'm really good. I, I should be watching. Nope. What he does in November does in June, which led to those assignments, is the discipline, not his greatness. It's his discipline that led to all those great assignments. And he shows it time after time after time when we watch video of him. So he's able to call that hole, right? If he would have stayed on the post of the ball, he would have missed the hole. See, remember I told you- This the, is the perfect one, watch yeah. Mark and, and Dan. But let me just hold one second. Remember I told you earlier, it's not about always about talent. Right? About discipline in your habits. You can have all the talent in the world. You're not looking at the right spot, you're in this spot. Ted Thomas, anyone know him? No? One, one, I got one head going up and down. Better vertical leap than LeBron. Just as big. Just shoot the three. Talent ain't it. He ain't on that stair matter than the Versa climber. And, and he was a good NBA player. He wasn't the great NBA player he might have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, no, 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 one year. But the biggest. And then, then he came on to our staff. Nicest young man. I mean, he's just a wonderful person. He's been critical of that. It's just talent. There's lots of things that go into our craft here. Talent being one of them, but only one of them. So you'll see the perfect sequence of heads. Watch Danny in the trail and Mark Davis in the slot. See, watch. He's head, right off. Now let's go back and watch Danny's head. Danny's on ball here. Watch his head. He's on ball. 
fit. She snapped into a position. Trust. See the width have reduced. And when you have you said, somebody mentioned back here, you have full coverage, right? It's the same thing. If we can reduce our handoffs, we're reducing the amount of time, right? What do we have? We have 94 by 50 time. Months. Which brings up a point, when you're working with someone who isn't disciplined and they have a number on their back, maybe it should be 5,094, right? Because <laughs> they think they got a referee 50 by 94. All right. We don't want to be those people. Let's take a look. What do we want to take? Yeah, let's take, we'll take a quick break and then come back. Five, five, five minutes, guys. Yeah. 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 So we've gone over yeah. the mechanic system and, you know, in rough terms, and we realized there are a few differences. I was talking about sort of the two people and the body contact.